Uh, I'd like to introduce John Russell. He uh, does this work on a full-time basis. Yeah. He's kind enough to come and demonstrate for us today. So please welcome John Russell. Yeah. 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 What I do is uh, mainly work in a hollow form. I've been attorney for about 23 years now. And about the first year or two, I did open bowls, and I figured I was turning away everything I liked about the piece. So I started working on the hollow form. Everything that I liked about the piece of wood, when I started to turn it, it was still there when I got done with taking everything out from the in, 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 inside of it. What I do is inlay of what's called chip inlay, which is basically taking a large stone or other material, breaking it in smaller pieces, and then setting each piece in like a mosaic, and then grinding it back down you know, uh, uh, after you have it set in. The reason for that is that you can control the color on the consistency of the color on what you inlay. If you use just ground up powderized uh, turquoise and a lot of the stuff that you get that they sell as turquoise isn't turquoise anyway, it's uh, copper sulfate, which is a byproduct of copper mining. And it looks a lot like turquoise, it's about the same color, but you can buy a truckload for about the size the price of a little piece of turquoise. So, if you, I have, uh, what I do is I separate out each type of turquoise that I have. Like this is a, a, a Arizona turquoise, which is a, the medium size blue. And this is the some of the, the uh, other uh, Arizona turquoise. Uh, this is the darkest of the turquoise, which is called azure blue. It's real deep dark. But by doing, by keeping everything of the piece that I originate, you know, the, the, the piece that I start out with, whenever I break it into smaller pieces, I always keep it together. So when I put it back in, it's going to be the same color. If I want to accent, then I can use a lighter color with it, or I can use uh, other material, like I have uh, uh, malachite, I used uh, azurite, which is real dark blue, uh, the, I've even put diamonds, I've used tiger eye, it, 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 just anything, as long, as long as it reflects the light rather than refracts the light. That's why a diamond works, but a ruby doesn't. If you put a diamond in, you have to leave the, the top facet just a little bit above the surface so that the light can refract off of the back side of the cut of the diamond. If you put a ruby in, it's just a dark hole. I also use opals, which work really well because they're a reflective, a refractive uh, uh, light surface. <laughs> I use Australian opals, like this one has Australian opals in it. <coughs> and uh, there's a little bit of fire opal in that one there. And these are the Australian opals. <coughs> they don't have a lot of, of light to them when you first you know, look at them like that, but when you put it into the piece and then I use super glue to hold them in, it's the, it's the embedding it in to the crevices and then filling it over with the super glue that forms the matrix over it. And that's where you'll get all of the color that comes out of it. You have to be really careful about how you place, especially power shell, which is a, like abalone, or uh, opals into an inlay because if the light doesn't refract off of it, and the problem is most of the time you're working on a piece like this, and you'll put a piece in there and it looks beautiful. The light's shining down on it and you set it up like that and you can't find it. <laughs> so keep those things in mind, especially with something that, that you know, needs light to refract, you know, reflect off of it. 
Um, I think the first thing on any inlay piece is look at the block of wood that you're going to make it out of. You have to start from the very beginning. The what you get is what you want. It rarely works. If you turn a piece and hope that there's a bunch of holes that are going to look right when you put something into it, generally what happens is it looks like you were trying to fix something. So think about the piece when you're cutting it out, when you're turning it, the shape of it, where you're going to have a focal point, where that when you, when you have the piece done, that it makes sense why the inlay was there. I have people all the time ask me where I get the wood that already has the turquoise in it. But there is no turquoise that I know of. So, but uh, I also inlay with uh, pewter. Any of the metal that's inlaid is pewter. And then anything that's applied, like this is all pewter here. It's pewter, turquoise, and opals. Um, then anything that's applied is uh, silver or sometimes I use gold wire as well. Whenever I inlay with the piece is going to have metal in it, the pewter, that's the first inlay that I do. The reason for that is the pewter, I'll turn back down the surface. Just, I mean, it's just, it's only setting up just a little bit, and I can actually turn that back down to the surface of it. <coughs> the turquoise, even though it's a fairly soft, the opal's fairly soft, you could turn it, but it generally doesn't work because you have just a little bit, and it's going to click, 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 and it's probably going to tear it out more than it's going to do anything else. So all of that has to be done by hand after you've turned the piece. The main thing is that you turn the piece first. It's basically finished down, sanded to what the finished surface would be before I do any of the inlay. And then you're messing it all up and you've got to kind of start all over again. But uh, as I put it in, it's going to raise it up and then I'm basically turning it back <clears throat> down. The one thing about inlaying is it's a long, drawn out process. There are some times that, that it takes me as long to inlay the piece as it does to turn the piece. And that's because each one of those little pieces gets put in one at a time. And then you've got to grind it all back down. So I'll, I'll show you how I do the, the, the pewter. And what I use, well, that's the opal there. The fire opal. What I use is, it's called casting pewter. Now you could use uh, larger pieces of pewter, you know, like the, the bars of pewter that you get from a jewelry supply store. But casting pewter comes in little beads like this. And the reason I use that is it's easier to do that. By flattening it down into little pieces, I'm going to have to get some glasses now. Then I can take, and if I'm going to do into a crevice like this, I can actually force it into the wood. You kind of want to get it forced down into the wood so that it's. So that it's not just sitting on the surface. The reason for that is, if you ever soldered anything, you wind up pulling more out as you heat it up than you do actually putting it in. So when you hammer it into the wood, sometimes they'll even, you know, kind of like tap it into the wood to try to fill up the void that you're going to use. And then I'll use the soldering iron to kind of weld it together. Thank you. 
sometimes they take, and if you like cut it in half, you know, with a little uh, shears, and then you can use like the half moon that you'll put half of it down in there and then hold the other half. Now once you kind of get a base, Kind of get a base, <clears throat> you can kind of start welding it. <coughs> until it kind of starts to, to puddle. <coughs> Does the fuse melt or do you have to put soldering flux or anything like that on it? No, it just it just melts. It will it'll flow into itself. Low heat or high heat? Pewter melts depending on the makeup around 465, 485. And wood burns at 451 if you believe Bradbury. So there's not a lot of difference in between burning it and melting the pewter into it. But because you're just barely melting it, the flash point of wood's much higher than that. The other thing is that once you kind of get a base in there, then you can kind of start picking up little pieces of the pewter on your soldering iron, and it will... And then it'll kind of, it'll kind of attach to your but the steel is real cold as well. And then you can kind of float it into the areas. But really what you're doing is, with the, the, is, is welding it into the wood. And the problem with it, just like I said with anything that you solder, is that you're, you're also trying to, as you try to put more in, it's trying to pull more out. Now there's no adhesive quality to the wood, to the pewter when it's in the wood. So if you were to just stick this back on the lathe, well, you'd have out. shrapnel. <laughs> <laughs> and it, that does happen, so. So what, how do you affix it to the wood? I use super glue. Okay, thin, uh, super thin glue. CA. I'll, I'll take the thin CA to hold it in, and then I will build up a matrix around it with the thicker uh, CA glue. And then, but usually the thin stuff will hold it in. The, the, the thicker stuff really, all it's really doing is it's, it's forming a filler around It's forming a filler around the little voids on it so that, that it will fill in the little voids around it. But basically, that's what you wind up. Now, if you were to pick, you could probably pick that right out of there. But because it's hammered down into that, it has a little bit of holding quality to it. So then I'll take the, the real thin stuff. And a lot of times when the pewter's still hot, this stuff smokes. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> stuff going all over. <laughs> yeah. And then you get the, the super glue high. You're good. <laughs> but see, it's really just just enough to, and, and you'll see it, let me see it smoking there. It'll wick all around down underneath there and hold it in. Now, right now, and this stuff here is the best stuff since can sliced bread or whatever. But you know, you just need you want you don't want to do a whole lot with this because you're going to have foaming and then you got all these little white streaks and everything else that gets into where you're you, you're doing the inlay. What is that, accelerator? Yeah, this is the accelerator for the, the CA glue. Yeah. And I like it. Uh, those little pump things, I, I use those for years and it seems like about the fourth pump the thing starts freezing up on you and then about the sixth pump you throw it away. <laughs> you get but, big droplets Yeah, too. and you get, and it's hard to get just a little spritz out of it. So. 
with the little with the aerosol cans I mean it's just you and if you get back you know because you don't want to get a whole lot on it especially with the thin stuff when you get into the thicker stuff then you can get a little bit more aggressive with the accelerator because generally I'm not a very patient person that's why I, you see most of these things are dry I use dry wood for 90% of what I turn for a couple of reasons one I don't want to wait for it to, to <coughs> go through the whole process of turning it green and then waiting for it because by the time I go back and look at the piece I've decided I didn't like what I did when I did it six months ago <laughs> and the other thing is that there's so much you know what's constantly moving it's always moving so if you like you see these this is this is a lid piece so it's going to have a lid on it at some point and I like the process of going from beginning to end in a transition. If I did it six months from now, like I said, I wouldn't like it and I'd be changing it and then I'd just basically, it sits on a shelf and becomes a dust stop for until I cut it off and put another piece on. But, um, um, and the other thing is that I've got so much wood that's been sitting around that it's all dry now. <laughs> it started out green at some point. But, I, but and, and the other aspect of it being dry is that all of those things like surface checking, the bark inclusions, all of those things are going to show up so that you know where the parts are that you're going to do the inlay. So that goes back to the original thing of looking at the piece of wood, figuring out where you want to end up before you ever start. Because uh, again, it, it rarely works out that you just turn a piece and everything's going to fall into place where you'll have a place to inlay that's going to look like it was a thought process rather than here's a hole I need to put something in it. Um, I'm not a big fan of the inlays and a lot of those things. I, I don't think they look organic. I think they look like you scraped up the gravel and because it's made up of so many different things that it doesn't have a real natural look to it and it's like someone once said about furniture it only looks as good as the day you brought it home it kind of has always felt to me that way with the, the granulated things I think they work better if you're using them in a contrived where you're doing a groove or you're doing something that you're that that it it, it looked like you were making an element in the piece and you were adding that other element to it. I always look for a more organic. Very rarely do I embellish the, the cracks or voids where I'm going to do the inlay. Uh, I think that leads to it looking more natural when you get you know, to, the, to the finished piece. Now at this point, it's pretty much held in there. So, I always take a little bit of the thicker stuff and kind of just basically paint it around the voids. I use a lot of super glue. We all. <laughs> well, I, I, I knew a fellow out in Maryland that had a piece and he actually wrote super glue on the bottom of the bowl so because it had more super glue than it had wood. <laughs> now sometimes see this but there's like a little edge in between there where it's kind of separated from the the void that was in it where the, the, the pewter is. Sometimes I'll fill that in sometimes I'll just go ahead and turn this back down which I'll do in a second and leave that void in there and then I'll come back in after I do the metal and I'll put a piece of turquoise or a piece of opal something that that kind of goes because turquoise and you know the, the pewter 
The nice thing about pewter is that once you turn it back down to the metal surface, you can polish it to a mirror finish, you can leave it as a brush finish, you can do anything in between. I've done pieces that were like this that had you know, a large pewter area on it that looks like a lake. It's just like a, you know, a, a silver. It looks like a silver mirror lake. You can actually see yourself in it. And once you polish it down, pewter isn't going to tarnish like, like silver would anyway. But uh, once you polish it down, you know, it, you really can't tell it from silver. A lot of people think that it's silver anyway. And silver and turquoise has always gone together well. So I first started using turquoise. The, the whole idea for doing an inlaid piece comes from a, a, a guy named Larry Faber, who at that time, that was 25, 30 years ago. He was doing pieces out of ironwood. He was from, at that time he lived in uh, Carefree, Arizona. And he did these beautiful sculptural pieces out of desert ironwood that he would <coughs> carve areas and put whales and dolphins in the wood out of silver. And then he would do bubbles of turquoise that were coming up from uh, <laughs> beautiful. Now he lives in uh, North Carolina, I think. But uh, he still does really beautiful work but I, I just I like the contrast of color with the wood what I didn't like was all the things that I tried before which had a synthetic whether it was colored paint or whether it was uh, acrylics and different things like that I, I at, at some point I came to the conclusion that if it's a natural element and it goes with another natural element, it works. If it's synthetic, it doesn't seem to work as well. But that's just my personal opinion. But, uh, now. Yeah, I should be able to see how close this lathe is to my lathe for a flat. <laughs> I've never put a piece on a two lathes that it actually was still going to. True, so <coughs> should be okay, it's not a one way. <laughs> <laughs> I was just waiting how long it would take. Yeah, you. I was counting oh, counting. <laughs> I wasn't going to say anything. No, no, no. <laughs> See, it's turning backwards. <laughs> See, now, what I do is, I, this is my scraper. Yeah. It's a chisel. <laughs> I, I like this because it's just a real fine, and I can just kind of go in real lightly. You don't want to get too aggressive with it. And you can kind of feel when it starts to get down to where it's matching with the wood surface again. And there are times when you'll get it down and all of a sudden it pops out on you. <laughs> Once you get down where you can feel it against the surface, you need to get a little more aggressive with it. Well, you couldn't you couldn't sand that to that extent, or what? <clears throat> you could you could sand it down, and I've done that sometimes, especially if I'm doing, if I'm putting stones along with it. Yeah. And that's eventually what I'll do on this piece, because I'm going to put a little bit of turquoise in alongside yeah. of it. Then I'll sand it down, because I never turn the turquoise like that. Yeah. But you can see, it gives you a nice, yeah. pretty nice finish the yeah. way it is. Now, once you sand it down, because I, I use air and a, and a grinder like this for rotary sanding on everything. So once you sand it down, it's going to be a little more uh, brush finish to it. 
Then if you want to go in and polish it in the end, use a little polishing uh, wheel with some, uh, uh, um, you know, the compound. And you can polish that up to a mirror finish. But what will happen is, because pewter has just a little bit of tin and other materials, uh, other metals in it, you know, kind of blacken around the edge of it. But what I found works really well is uh, the Balin's, uh, where I'm sure there's other de-waxer that you put on to, before you'd spray with lacquer. And it will take most all of that discoloring off. Now, if it's a real light wood like holly or even, you know, a really light maple, sometimes you get a staining from the pewter that I, I don't usually use pewter on a really super light wood for that reason. Although I, I would use it on that uh, rhododendron there, bigger piece. It, it would be fine on that. You won't get much discoloring on it. But uh, uh, I just think that the, it just adds a really nice contrast, you know, because you've got a little bit of eye-catching, you know, with the, the shiny, you know, shiny objects always attract things, so. Where do you get your casting pewter from? It's hard to find. I, I, luckily, I have quite a bit of it, so I haven't had to get any for a while. The real small beads like this, uh, I used to get it from a place in uh, Alexandria called Lubon's, but they went out of business about 15 years ago, so that's not a good place to go look for it. But, uh, I'm sure if you go online, you know, to uh, you know Google, you know, casting pewter, the beads are are. It really, I've kind of gotten to the point now that I'm, I'm probably going to have to take and, and uh, uh, Rio Grande jewelry supply out in uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. Okay. They're a real good source for anything that relates to jewelry. You can get uh, different pewter. There, it's it's generally it's in a bar, and then all you really have to do is just kind of melt it and drop it and make your own beads out of it. It uh, melts like I said with a soldering iron or you know. I've used, a lot of people use these um, uh, low melt metals. The only problem with low melt metals, and this comes from experience, is that if you have your piece sitting out in the sun, or you have a halogen light on it, it'll put out enough heat that it'll melt the low melt metals. <laughs> and all of a sudden your, your, your um, uh, really nice inlay that was on the surface now is dripping down through the surface. <laughs> I actually had a, a, a bigger piece like this that I'd done with a low melt metal in a large area like that because it was, it was so big that doing it with pewter would have taken a long time. And I, and I tried with the low melt metal and then I had it sitting in a show and had a halogen light that was pretty focused on it and just the beam of the halogen light actually made it soft. So I took it out. <laughs> I've tried Bondo, but it won't shine up, so it's yeah, dull. Yeah, it's not yeah I, I've tried the stuff that the dentists use. Uh, what are that? Mal you know, amalgam. amalgam. Yeah, Perfect. amalgam. I've, I've never really, number one, it's really expensive and it's real, you got to shake it to get it to, to, to break the catalyst on it. I've never found it to be anywhere near as, as good as the look you get out of pewter. Beautiful there. Have you pewter. ever tried 50-50 solder? Yeah, again, the, the, the solder doesn't have as bright because solder, <clears throat> solder doesn't have as much tin and, and I think it's, I can't remember what the makeup. Pewter, there's different makeups of pewter that that's why the difference in the melting points, where they melt between about 465 up to about 490, something like that. And it's the, it, most modern pewter doesn't have much lead in it, or any lead. Some doesn't have any lead, but some does still have a little bit of lead in it. So that is one concern that you have to worry about with pewter. But uh, I've never used the solders. Um, um, they, they, it very well may be that the, uh, like the 50-50, you may get the same effect out of it. I have a feeling that the solder is a much softer than the pewter would be.
solder because solder is going to melt at a little bit lower temperature. Yeah. 5050 50 solder, 250, 300 degrees. Yeah. <clears throat> so, you know, you, you do get a, a, a really pretty hard surface from the pewter. And again, it's, it's just a, a nice range of the melting point that it actually does, you know, work pretty well. Let's pick out a turquoise here. Have you ever tried using the key brass ground up fine? I, I, I experimented a little bit with it. Again, it kind of falls into that category of the ground up turquoise. It never really looked like metal and it never really looked like I don't know what it looked like. It looked like something ground up, and I it just didn't it, it it didn't it didn't appeal to me. I've seen pieces that were done with the ground brass and copper. Um, you know, I, I I think that they you know they they look fine. They just I, I don't think they look natural. You know, it, it doesn't feel as natural as the. I found out that if you take the key brass as it comes from mm -hmm. these stations. And put it in an old coffee grinder. You can make you it, get it into a, yeah. to a pure powder, right? And it gives you a gold streak. Yeah, yeah. And it, it feels small crack, really. Right. Yeah. It's for something like that, I, I could I could see it being you know a, a really good thing. I, I, it's like the opals. Uh, when I break up opals, the to smaller little pieces, you get a lot of opal dust. Mm -hmm. And the opal dust is really good for doing that, where you can kind of rub it around an area and uh, put it, and, and it will it will refract because now you've got a little fast, a whole bunch of little facets, and it'll pick up the light really well. Uh, more than likely, you're going to glue more of it to your finger, putting it in, than you actually get in there. But uh, it does work pretty well that way. Now I have a very sophisticated method for breaking up turquoise. I take my little body iron here and I have this little cup that goes over the top of it and I have a piece of 3 8 drill blank and a hammer. And now instead of one piece I got a bunch of little pieces. Yeah. And my grandmother was a big jigsaw puzzle person. And she got so good at it for years, she used to get to the point to where she would turn everything upside down. And you could participate in the process, but if you picked a piece up and it didn't fit, you were out. And I guess I got good at picking up the right piece to put into the hole, because that's really what it amounts to, is finding the right piece that goes into the right hole. But it's really, again, it's it's like a mosaic. And I use a little tweezers that... So you'll see that there's little shards. Different turquoise will break in different patterns. Some of it is very square. Some of it has a very, you know, long shards that will go into the real small cracks. And uh, it just kind of, I, I just kind of categorize them so that I know where they're going to be, you know, the type of turquoise that's going to work. And then it's just a matter of forcing it into the void to keep it in there and below the surface enough that can't talk and think at the same time. Um, enough below the surface that, that as you grind it off, you're not going to grind off everything that you put in. So you have to have a little of it that goes down inside there. And I, I get real, push it in there, you know. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, what's really that pretty inside the pewter that you put in? Is that what you're doing? Yeah, pewter? this, I'm, I'm putting a little bit, I'm putting a little bit all around it. Okay. It's a labor intensive process. Yeah. Pardon? Very labor intensive and time consuming. Yeah, process. yeah. I mean, it's again like I've I've spent as much time putting it in and then putting it back in and putting it back in. Well, may I ask you uh, about retail or what you sell your pieces for to make it worth your while to do all that? Uh, a piece like you're working on, for instance. This piece is twenty three hundred dollars. Okay. The smaller ones like this. 
I've gotten pretty fast at them. I, I can get those down. They range from 280 to 350 in that range, depending on the wood. Sometimes the wood adds a lot, you know, because I use a lot of exotic woods. Um, the the about the smallest ones that I do, you know, they run around a, you know 185 to 200 somewhere in that range. So the bigger pieces go up to you know, as much as you have galleries that request this from you. Or? I I used to do a lot with galleries. I don't do as much with galleries. I mainly do shows uh, around the country. Parker, I'm leaving. Um, I have a show the 20th of the weekend of the 20th of uh, this month in San Antonio. It's a two-day show there. Then I go up to Oklahoma City for a six-day show. And there's nothing more fun than six days outdoors in Oklahoma City. <laughs> 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 it may. Uh, I, I, um, I, I was born in Oklahoma, and uh, I was doing a show out in, San, uh, in uh, California in La Quinta. And the group, the people who were the co-chairs that year, they came out and they said, you really should do this show. And I told them, I said, Larry, I grew up in Oklahoma, and the idea of doing an outdoor show for six days without getting hit by a tornado is just something I can't wrap my head on. But he said, no, no, we, you really should do it. And I've been doing it for about five, six years now, and it's actually a pretty decent show. They get about a half million people show up that show. Wow. Mm -hmm. What part of Oklahoma? Oklahoma City, right down uh, I, I grew up in Davis. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just north of Ardmore. Yeah, uh, Duncan's where I grew up. Okay. Yeah. Until I moved to Montana. But, uh, but yeah, you know, the April and, and uh, tornadoes in Oklahoma are pretty much, you know, yep. one and the same. So, but, uh, and then I come back and do a show the next weekend in Rockville. So, but I do about 20 shows a year, depending, all over the country. So. <coughs> Now, I found that once you kind of start putting the turquoise in, it's kind of like the pewter. You, you have to kind of build it as you go along because if you try to put everything that you want to put in before you start doing any glue, it's a never-ending process that you'll never get to that point because you're going to be knocking something out before you get to the next point of putting the other thing in. So I just use a little bit of super glue to just kind of hold it in. This is the thin now? Yeah. Uh, I always start out with the thin because it kind of wicks around it. <coughs> they need to give you about 20 of these little spouts at a bigger bottle. Yeah. Because you really need No wonder it didn't come out. <laughs> <laughs> the, the finer tip actually <clears throat> works better when you're just down. putting it, holding it in. Uh, no, it's not. Oh. <laughs> you know, so you can glue it to the... Well, who's in charge of our glue department? We're running out there. So. How did that work? This week, John. <laughs> Peter, do you want me to pass around the sheet of the particular one? Mm -hmm. That would help out. Okay. Get the spray accelerator too. Okay. Aerosol. Get the spray. The aerosol. The aerosol. The aerosol. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, it, it's exactly the same stuff as you get in a pump bottle, but I, I think you, you wind up using a fraction of what you normally do with pump bottles. Or something. Because the pressurized scan makes it so much nicer. Yeah. Not the aerosol. And really, the price-wise, I think these things are somewhere around ten bucks or something like that. Ten, twelve bucks. Now, when I'm doing opal, that's kind of a little different thing. Opal, you really don't grind it down. Oh, thanks. You, you, you really, it's like setting it into the void and then building the super glue over the top of it. 
So when you put it in, it's nice to have a light so that you can see where the refraction is going to be and when you're doing a piece. I do most of the inlay off the lathe unless it's here. Yeah. And then I do it on the lathe yeah. because it's just easier to do it like that. But uh, I find that, that you know, the, the, the opal, uh, there's a little trick you can do. Take, and I forgot to bring one, uh, a Sharpie, black Sharpie. Anything like power shells, anything that refracts, like uh, this is power shell, which is like an abalone shell. It's a mollusk from the South uh, Islands, South Sea Islands. Um, I get this from a place in Hawaii called Hawaiian Lure, because they make lures out of it. But uh, they do it in sheets. It's really a bunch of little, sh they shave it off and put it into a sheet. Now this is the, the standard that doesn't have a backing on it. So if you put that in, it's going to look different. It's going to be lighter, and it's also going to re reflect what's behind it. So if it's dark wood, you're going to have pretty good ref refraction out of it. If it's light wood, you're not going to have as good refraction. So if you take a, a Sharpie and just kind of color in around the void that you have in there, then it forms what's basically called a doublet, which is what this is. And that's they put a black backing on it so that it will make it re refract a lot better. Mm -hmm. You get a lot deeper color out of it. It's basically the same thing, mm -hmm. but it's the back, the black backing on it. Now with the, the power shell, basically what I do with this stuff is I just break off a little piece and kind of force it into the void and I kind of squish it down, you know, with the, the so it kind of fits down underneath it and then hold it in with super glue and I'll I'll take and like say I was going to glue it on here I'll hold it down until it sets and then break the tweezers off of it so that it's under the surface then when you put the thicker super glue over it it looks like it's right on the surface then because it will be just enough under it now you can't have a lot that's why it's really kind of critical that you have it pretty well surface sanded the way that the finished piece should be uh, because you don't have a lot of leeway you wind up taking everything that you just did off when you go through the the final sanding process but at this point It's just held in with the thin super glue, but again, the same thing, I don't want to go through the whole process here, is I will put just <laughs> enough, kind of build a little, fill in the, the areas around it. I use a lot of uh, the super glue on it because I want it to kind of bead up. If you can see it, it it actually sits way above the surface. The reason for that is that it's going to you can kind of see when it starts to set. I love the smell of this stuff. <laughs> it's like taking bug spray. But um, you can see it's kind of start to set up, but you really want it to be up above the surface so that it's higher than what, you know, the, everything is filled in because once you sand this back down the surface, then it fills in all the, and it just feels like it's, it's always been part of it that way. Now, I sand, these little discs. Uh, uh, if you go down and buy these discs, they're like gold, you know, they're, I don't know how much they are for 10 of them, and I go through 10 of them in about five minutes. So, this is how you make them. <laughs> the real thin ones work the best, and kind of grind the edges off of them. I take a little uh, Dremel tool, and I, I cut it so that it's like a little flat tooth on it, and then you just make a little base 
put in a drill press and I make about a thousand of these things. But uh, if you use the, the fresh ones, it's going to be way too aggressive unless you have a lot of turquoise or a lot of the stone sitting above it. So if you use the fresh one and you want to do that, next thing you know, now you've got a faceted yeah. vessel rather than a round vessel. So save all the little pieces that you have. It's over there. I save all the ones that are all spent and that's what I use to grind all this down. Because they're dull and they hardly have that much grinding ability to them anyway. Mm -hmm. So you can be a lot more ginger about the way that it uh, comes off that way. Are, is that that sandpaper, is that hook and loop? Or yeah, uh, hook and okay. loop. I get it from Clingspore. Okay. Get it in a roll. Uh, you know, it's. Uh, I, I actually like that uh, thinner stuff better. The one with the gray backing on it. I, I like the thinner stuff better than the, the, the thicker stuff because the the one that's kind of uh, uh, aluminum oxide, I don't know, they're just real stiff. And I don't think they have as much flex out of them. Where with this, I've got, you know, quite a bit of flex out of them. Yeah, the, the Everlong, the Scree? Mm -hmm. The, okay. Yeah, I don't know what the, the, the it comes in two different, uh, the four inch is best because you can get two rows. <laughs> if you get the three inch, you have about a one inch strip that you wind up making other things out of. But uh, I, I ordered the three inch incorrectly a couple of times like that. And, and uh, you don't get as much yield out of it as you do in the four inch. I think I'm going to need, how does this thing turn on? Go yeah. box up on your left, box up on the shelf. Where's that? Oh, this switch. Okay. Now Sometimes I'll suck the shavings out, but it just works better to blow them out sometimes than it does anything else. But anyway, you, you, what I'll do is I'll grind this back down to where it's right on the, the, the surface when it gets flat. Now, I use the finish that I use, because I start out with, a, with an oil finish, a, de, a deft oil, a wacko oil, or deft, whichever. Finish, yeah. Um, part, there's a couple of reasons for that. It's a really good lubricant for when I polish the stones and even the, the, the um, uh, pewter. I'll start out sanding about maybe use 150 and then I'll go up to 400 on these on the disc <coughs> and then I'll once I get that all sanded down then I'll take and paint it with the the wacko oil, and then I use 600 wet and dry. That I'll kind of go over the whole surface. Now the nice thing about the oil is, being a lubricant, it'll polish the the, the stones for one thing, but it also brings out a lot of the texture in the grain, the deep part of the texture in the grain that with an oil finish that you're not going to get with the lacquer finish that I put on over it. But you can spray lacquer over oil, no problem. You can do it in 
while it's still wet and it'll just leach through the lacquer as far as that goes. But uh, I let it dry a couple of days before I actually spray it with the lacquer. But then you get a lot of depth. You build the depth up with the lacquer and I mix mostly about 50-50 semi-gloss to gloss because I don't like a real glassy finish to it so it kind of cuts that a little bit. But uh, but anyway, you know, with the and then then the the last thing I'll do is uh, use like the uh, I'll use 400 wet and dry or 600 wet and dry, and then uh, I may even go up to 1200 wet and dry. Wet and dry. And uh, again, the oil just kind of forms a lubricant on it, but it also kind of fills in a little bit of the, the, the eyes and the different things from the oil. And then just spray lacquer over the top of it. So you use it 600 twice, that's 1,200. <laughs> <laughs> if you add it all together, it's about 2,800, 20, I guess. <laughs> Good thing you went to college, Charlie. <laughs> it's science. I know. Yeah. This is the 400, and the 600, and this is the 1200. And then before I do the lacquer, then I'll go over it with the scotch bright, the gray, and then the white. And it's just kind of to rough it up. And sometimes I'll do that in between the, the, the lacquer, but I, I usually don't sand in between. And that gets your the uh, pewter uh, nice polish. Well, yeah, you, the, before you spray anything on it, you got to do whatever you're going to do to the pewter. Whether it's, uh, again, if, it, if I want a real bright finish to it, then I'll use a little Dremel tool with, okay. a, with a, a buffer on it and then a, a buffing compound, mm -hmm. and I'll polish it up. If I want it to be more brushed, then just the sanding with the, with the 1200 gives a really nice brush. That's, that's what this is here. Of course, you have to. Uh, you do all this once you finish the back and so on, then, or while it's still on the lathe. I do. I do everything. The piece. This piece never comes off the lathe until I'm done with it. Oh, I mean, okay. it never comes off of the the, the chuck until yeah. I'm done with it. I'll do everything that I'm going to do with this. I'll build the the, oh. the the lid on another lathe that I put in here. And by the time I get done, it's all stuck together there. Then I part it off, and then I'll take and turn this around, and I turn the, the foot on it. Yeah. The piece is never done until it's got a foot on it. Yeah. How much time, for the example of that one, how long do you estimate it takes you uh, to do that? A piece like that from... With the inlay, I, I can do a couple of them a day, mm -hmm. you know, two, three a day. It, it depends on the wood. Walnut, this walnut's really quick to turn. Uh, usually what I do is I'll turn a whole bunch of pieces like this. I'll get them all done, and then I'll do the inlay here, sometimes before I do either the, the, the neck on it or yeah. it, it kind of depends on the piece. If, I, if it's a lidded piece like this, uh, I'll do the whole thing. I'll do the inlay and then I'll do the lid and then I'll part it off and then I turn the bottom of it and I'll have them all sit and I'll spray them all. And you hollow that through that little hole? Yeah. Well, how would quartz be? Too hard? Quartz is really hard. Too hard? Quartz, uh, most scale quartz is about <laughs> yeah. nine, yeah. eight and a half. Too hard? Tiger Eye. I did a piece with Tiger Eye. And that was about as hard as I, I actually used the diamond files on that to get it. Uh, it's because, again, it's it's the not only the hardness but still to be able to get the the you know the the tiger eye is kind of a curved surface to begin with, and so once you grind it off, you've lost the the, the, the refraction of the eye in it. <coughs> um, opals, I mean, um, um, freshwater pearls. I've used those. They work pretty well, um, as long as they don't have the hole in them. You're doing the pretty high-end cost stuff. Yeah, well, some of it, like this is coral here, red coral. 
Uh, some of it you can get. Um, uh, generally speaking, uh, you know, the I don't. It starts out like a little piece of turquoise like this. You know, that's thirty, forty dollars worth of turquoise. Yes, sir. But you know, you can do a whole lot of pieces out of that thirty dollars worth of turquoise. So. Uh, some of the, the opals and things like that, they get to be a little more. I, I ran into a guy at a, a, a good place for the minerals and things like that is like the gem shows. Right. They have one in uh, uh, at, um, Chantilly. Chantilly, yeah. Two, twice a year. Twice a year, yeah. They it's a really good place. Pardon? They went in Waynesboro. Oh, did they? Every yeah. year. Yeah. yeah. They're, they're, they're a year. great place for, for a lot of stuff like that that, that works. And uh, I was at one, and there was a guy from Cooper Pedy uh, in Australia, the opal mines. And I got to talking to him about what I did, and he, he said, well, come back when he was going to be back. You know, it was like in the spring, and I and it was in the, the second show. And I came back, and he had a little jar full of broken pieces, broken cabochons that he basically gave me for practically nothing because they weren't that useful to him but they were really useful to me so I mean there's there's a a lot of ways I whenever I'm traveling when I used to do uh, more shows in the southwest I'd stop in these little shops that you know had rock you know on the yeah. side of the road with the rattlesnakes and, and uh, <laughs> you know they, they they'd have a little packet of turquoise out of one of the local mines that you could get for you know, not very much, but uh, you can order it. Uh, you can find it on eBay. Yeah, a yeah. A lot of times, it's the uh, the pieces that are too small. Right. Yeah. Like this is a this is a azurite. It's uh, basically that, and they you know the smaller pieces like that. But you, azurite is it's a nice color. Um, it's a real dark blue. It's it's like a lapis, but it's much softer than lapis. Lapis is pretty hard. Lapis is about seven and a half. Eight on the most scale. So that's going to, you know, you're going to spend a lot of time and it's really hard to get it down flat without, because you're, 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 you're dealing with a wood that's about a two to an eight, and it's pretty hard to get it flat at some point. But, uh, you know, but even a little piece of, this is ash right here with malachite. I've, I've taken and sliced this with a diamond saw and then inlaid and in larger, but it, it sands down. La uh, azurite is a lot easier to work with than uh, lapis, something like that. They're used for your pigments. Pardon? For lessons pigments. Uh, I, I played around a little bit with that, but I never really, uh, I never got anything that worked for me. <laughs> what about uh, Amazonite? That's a Virginia stone? Over a it looks like it looks like a lighter. Um, it's a blue stone. Yeah, I I I haven't used I've used Chris Cola. It's really hard. I, I don't know what the hardness is uh, of, uh, of of that particular material. Um, some of it is just so hard that it's it doesn't fracture very easily. It, it, it might be better if it if you ground it into a powder and used it like that, it probably, you know, if it's a really hard stone, but it's hard to get it ground into a powder if it's really hard stone. But um, um, the, you really, I, I find that something that's going to be, I think opal's around a six in a Mo scale, so it's about as hard as you really want to deal with. Uh, if you're going to be sanding anything, but almost anything, if you if you if you set it just below the surface and then you build the matrix over it, and you get all of that effect, but it may lose all the quality. If it's color, it's not going to be a problem. If it has some refractive qualities to it, uh, then then it does become a problem. Have you ever used cast resin? I I have a little bit, but not not much. I never I, I well I, I use casting resin in, in the pins. I, I, I make pins out of snake skin. I, know, I don't know if you're familiar with Alan Trout's work down from San Antonio. Mm -hmm. uh, he does he does these. Uh, he, he actually casts uh, anchor caps. Oh, uh -huh. the resin and, and also yeah yeah work. yeah. I, I knew a guy years ago. He did. Uh, um, Pick uh, pickup sticks, little 
he he cast those. He I don't he he kind of I thought he did it in in a really labor intensive way. He'd cast it as a block, and then he would turn it like he was turning a solid piece of wood rather than casting. The we saw one of our symposium. Well, then all of a sudden he decided he had all these shavings that were all these different colors of wood with a black matrix. So he took and glued all that back together, and he turned that again, so it looked like confetti, you know. But uh, yeah, there's there's a lot. Of, I mean, I think anything that you can put in it that makes sense, you know, that that you know, if it works, it works, you know. But uh, I I played around with, but I haven't really gotten it to where I've come up with a way to really do it the way I like, or the way the way it would look right for me. It, because I make a lot of cast pins. I use feathers and snake skin. I've even done butterfly wings. And, <laughs> and believe me, there's nothing about a butterfly wing that wants to let you do that. <laughs> but I've thought about doing, because I've got a lot of little pieces and stuff with different snake skin, because I just love the pattern, you know, the, the snake skins and feathers, you know, the whole patterns that you see in woods also are all the things that attract me to them. And I've thought about doing some inlay where I would uh, set the... Um, you know those materials in the piece and then cast the resin over it. I don't know uh, a friend of mine, Ron Cisco. He does some table. He's from somewhere on down in Arizona. He does these tables where he uses river rocks, yeah. the little pebbles, and he had and mainly it's mesquite that has a lot of voids in it. He uses he calls it turquoise, but it's actually copper sulfate <coughs> because he pours tons of this stuff in it. And he does these huge tables that have turquoise veins through it, and then he does the little river stones, and then pours the resin over it, and then finishes it off. But it's a flat surface, so yeah. I don't know adhesive-wise what the, the the qualities are to this casting resin. Doesn't have very much adhesive quality to it. So Marine that, epoxy, perhaps. Yeah. Uh, the, it's uh, again. I mean, it, it could. Uh, th that may be the the answer. You know, uh, uh, the the epoxies. I, I've never really liked epoxies for casting, but it may work for something like that. Because so uh, it depends on the largeness of the void. Right. Of right. what kinds of things you can afford. I mean, it's, <laughs> right. So you can't. On a void like that, when that bay's there, <coughs> would you put a filler in that first and then work over top of that? No, what, what I would do on this piece is I, I would take and I would, uh, first off, I, you know, to hold the bark in, because I like the contrast of things around the bark area, uh, I would take and put the super glue in. Oh, thanks. The, the super glue in it to, to hold the bark so that it doesn't fly out. I've done, I did a piece that had an op a void that was this wide that went all the way down here yeah. and it went all the way down here. And I actually had to glue a piece on it to hold it as I hollowed it. And then once I filled it with uh, pewter all the way around, then the pewter actually had enough adhesive quality to it that held it to somewhat together. And then I take and wrap tape around it and then cut the block off that was holding the top part off and then turn that and then fill that part and then go to the next step. So it's kind of a, but uh, you'd be surprised. I mean, this piece here, it had some pretty good openings in it. And, and it, I never glued anything on that when I was turning it. Yeah. It's amazing how much, I mean, it's, wood turning is a finesse and not brute strength. So you kind of have to, Finesse the wood off, but it's 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 always banging around on you. You could use uh, yeah. epoxy and manure. What? Yeah, no. You beat me too. Turquoise. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, and, and if you're if you're breaking it into small, I mean, because you can see this is pretty much all the same. There's a couple that may be you know yeah. different, but they're all out of the same 
you know, the same mine. Turquoise is is basically from where it's mined. Like Sleeping Beauty is is probably the most common that people know of. It's because it comes from the Sleeping Beauty mine. And it has a very distinctive lighter color to it. But each mine has a different color to it. I have about probably six or seven different uh, um, turquoises that I've collected over the years. And uh, some of the, like the Chinese turquoise has almost a green, um, a green, a real light turquoise green color to it, where the azure blue is just the really super dark blue. Well, jade, the Chinese would use jade. Uh, jade, I've used jade. Yeah. It depends on the jade. I mean, there's a lot of variation in jade. Uh, it, it, it doesn't really have much of a color or texture to it that yeah. if it's a larger area that has a little more something going on in it, that it, it's fairly soft. Jade cars pretty easily. I mean, it's it would work like that. But it just looks like a filler more yeah. so than that you, you can really see what it is. How about onyx? Do you ever use any onyx on anything? It's pretty soft, basically, I think. Uh, not that I remember. Uh, we have a lot of that over in the Middle East. Yeah, you know, gold stone, you know, which is a synthetic stone. It's nice because when you grind, I mean, it's it's kind of a, uh, a a ground material that's put back together, and that's where the the the, the kind of coppery flicker that it has. What about mica or is it malachite? Uh, malachite is uh, malachite's real hard, but it, malachite is uh, I have some malachite in here somewhere. Um, malachite generally is you'll find it with azurite. And sometimes I'll take where you have uh, malachite, which is the greener, that has the bluer azurite on it. I've, I've done a couple pieces where I sliced it off and set it in and then turned it down. And it just looks like the, you know, the little different divisions to it. But uh, it's, uh, malachite itself can be, some malachite is really hard. It's, you know, up in the six, seven, eight, eight range. So it's up around tiger. I but, what uh, is your chuck? It's tiny. What is the chuck? What's that? Uh, faceplate? The faceplate, you mean? Yeah. Well, well you've got uh, a faceplate. Yeah, it's just a that. faceplate. Oh, yeah, oh, I, I, I use, I use faceplates for everything. Oh, okay. um, if you'll notice there, that's wow. a one inch, eight nut welded to a large eight. washer. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of those. Um, because I'll, again, I'll I'll take and the way I mount the piece is that I'll, I'll turn this on on a lathe and put a little tendon on this end and then I'll put a little mortise joint inside there and then I use a uh, five minute epoxy and I glue that to it so it's that that's where it lives until I part it off and then when I part it off I turn the bottom and it's done but it never comes off of there so I'll I'll have thirty of these things that's why I have a whole lot of those. Um, but I put the piece on and I just leave them on until I get to the finished part. Tell us a little bit about your your hollowing techniques and so on. Well, I I use I, I made most of the tools. Actually, I have some of them over there. The the tools that I do the hollowing. It's it's basically an S curve. I'm I'm not really a big fan of the Ellsworth L because yeah. Uh, David's a nice guy, just he, and he knows how to hold the thing. I just find there's just so much torque and things that when I'm doing hollowing, I kind of do it different. Than a lot of people do in the sense that I don't really use a scraper method like David does, where he, he takes and he just kind of scrapes along, and it's very gingerly, you know, uh, works it down. I use cutters that. I put on the end uh, made out of ten ton G that I silver solder onto the end of the piece and then I'll start actually down and I kind of do a kind of like this so it's actually kind of a sheer cut all the way like it's making a curve around inside um, and then the finish cut a little trick that Ray Allen showed me about 25 years ago is I use um, a little file Take a, a regular file, 
and drill a hole through it. That's what I use on there. You can solder it onto oh, something. Okay. So take a file and use that as your cutter. If you get a real fine yeah. file, you'll get a surface that's about like 100 grit sandpaper. He used it because when you're doing segmented pieces, all the, the fuzz that you get off of the, you know, the, the end grain, and he would do the last cut was with this little file that he had yeah. ground to a to a, an angle. He was the most anal retentive <laughs> person I've ever met. I mean, the the the, the tolerance that, that he would do the segmented pieces. I mean, you know, sand it to ten thousandths of an inch. But he was the best segmenter I ever saw. I don't know if that answered all the questions or. <laughs> Would you show us your tool? You said you had. Oh. basically uses three-eighths drill steel that I'll bend into shapes and then I put a little screw on the end there and this is this is a file cut or not. Now this one here is a Tantung G. Tantung G is a, a material that's uh, used in metal lace for uh, cutoff tools mainly and it's a cast material. Um, that's, that's this yeah, Tantum G, yeah. And how do you drill? Uh, I got a whole story for that one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Tantum G is, is really hard. It's, it's almost as, as, as will hold an edge like carbide. But because it's a cast material, you can actually silver solder it onto cherry red and it won't lose its hardness. Because it's all little cast little crystals rather than a, a, a solid piece of metal. So I take yeah. yeah, that's one of the hollow pieces that I use for the hollow. And I used to take and cut oh, a little okay. groove in it, mm -hmm. make like a little and then just mm -hmm. silver solder it right into mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, into the, 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 the curve and then once I kind of grind it down to the point where I can use it, I can just take and melt that off and silver solder another piece on it, and you're good to go again. But uh, I just use a, a straight uh, drill uh, rod. Drill rod, yeah. Not uh, sure hard, and then that because it's easy to, to bend it to whatever shape you want. Just eat it and bend it. Yeah. Yeah, that's a piece of pie. I got okay. a bunch of different the, the ones for the big pieces like that. Not like that. <laughs> I use the push power handle, the arm brace one. This one here, I don't know how he stopped it. Silver stop. You just put this machine down. And it's silver stop. That's the material that he's just soldered on. Yeah, the 